so, so let, let me just jump in here to uh, what, I, what I think is a, a really important message that will impact your life and impact the lives of people around you. Some time ago, I watched a movie you may have seen called The Diving Bell and The Butterfly. It tells a story that is sad and inspiring at the same time based on the memoir of Jean-Dominique Bobby. Bobby was the sophisticated and successful editor of the French uh, magazine Elle and a, a highly respected journalist. But at just age 43, he suffered a stroke. He was in a coma for 20 days. And when he woke up, he had lost the ability to move any part of his body except for one eye. He could blink one eye. He had vision, but he couldn't move. He had all of his mental faculties, but did not have the ability to communicate his thoughts, at least not until he learned how to painstakingly communicate to a loving caregiver by blinking his one eye. He learned to blink out letters in the alphabet and then words and sentences and paragraphs. And this is how he wrote his memoir, which is just a stunning work of art. And in his memoir, then, he shared his terrifying experience of living with this condition called locked-in syndrome. A person with locked-in syndrome has vision, but they cannot execute their vision. When I think about this, I can't help but wonder if this is how God must sometimes feel. Scripture tells us that God, through Jesus, is the head of the body, the church, we know that God, the head, has a vision, but that in this world he's chose, he has chosen to limit the execution of that vision to the church, his body. He will only do what he does on this planet through his body. We, all of us together, are his body. Each of us as individuals are members of his body, and God will only do what he's going to do on this planet through us. And I would submit that we ought not be the cause of God experiencing locked-in syndrome. Now, this is particularly relevant as it concerns this series that we're in, The Lord Bless You. Uh, Pastor Jonathan has masterfully talked over the last couple of weeks about how much God wants to bless people, how he wants to do good in us and to us and through us, and also about how blessing is inextricably related to each of us fulfilling our purpose, how that in God's first interaction with the man and woman he made, he blessed them and then delineated his purpose for them. He decided to do what he's going to do on this planet through the people he made. We were made to partner with God in fulfilling his vision on this planet. He didn't have to do it this way, but this is the way he chose to do it. I love the way Philip Yancey, the uh, author, wrote that man is God's risk. And then he says, nearly everything theologians say about human freedom sounds somehow right and somehow wrong. How can a sovereign God take risk or imprison himself? Yet the creation of man and woman approached that kind of astonishing self-limitation. So again, I repeat myself. God has chosen to fulfill his vision on this planet through people like you and me. And this is true about lots of things, and it's particularly true about God's desire to bless humanity. He wants to bless people through you. You are an agent of God's blessing. Now, the flip side of that means that there may be blessing that doesn't happen. In fact, there will be blessing that won't happen if not for you. I may have messed that sentence up, but I think you got the point. You are an agent of God's blessing. We see this demonstrated when God chose Abraham out of everybody in the world and made covenant with him so that Abraham through his family could carry out God's vision for humanity. Genesis 12 says, the Lord had said to Abram, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This is ultimately fulfilled, of course, in the person of Jesus Christ, who came from Abraham to bring God's blessing to the planet. 
We're told in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, that those of us who believe in Jesus have received the blessing of Abraham. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. We've received the blessing of Abraham now through Jesus, and part of the blessing of Abraham is the privilege and need to bring blessings to others. Remember what God said to Abraham? I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to bless the world through you. So to restate, God's blessing, God's vision was and is to bless the people he created. But the other part of this is to say that his vision is to bless the world through us, and that vision will not be fulfilled unless it's fulfilled through us. We must bring God's blessing to the world. I want us to have a sense of how powerful the opportunity is to mediate God's intention to bless humanity how that this actually happens through people. Most of the time, when God blesses people, it's, it's not, it's not uh, a, 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 an experience just between a human being and God, although that happens in a dramatically spiritual way. But I think most of the time, in the practicalities of life, God's blessing flows through other people to people. This is the way he planned for it to happen. There are a number of ways that we can bless other people. But a good overview of just kind of some of the ways we might think about this is to say that if I bless another person, it means that I invoke and help bring God's blessing into their lives. I offer them unconditional love. I let them know how valuable they are to God and to me. I speak good into their future in a way that shapes reality. And I act in ways to help bring that future to pass. These, this is what happens when I bring God's blessing to other people. Not, that's not uh, 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 an, a, a comprehensive statement, but it's a taste of the kind of thing that happens when we bless other people. I love how uh, God told Moses how to teach the priest to bring a blessing on the people. We find this in the, uh, in the Torah when uh, in Numbers 6, uh, this is how you're to bless the Israelites. This is God speaking to Moses. This is how you're to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And then... Most of us are familiar with that part, but here's a very interesting framing of this. Then God said, so they, meaning the priest, will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Note, God said, when you bless the people, you put my name on them and I will bless them. Now, in the Old Testament, there was a, there was a class of priests who were uniquely uh, permitted to give that kind of blessing. But in the New Testament, there is no special class of priests. Scripture says we are all priests before God. We all have the ability to mediate things from God into this world. And this includes blessing. So the fact is, when you bless another person, person. God, you put God's name on them and God blesses them. God says, when you bless somebody, I bless somebody. That's how it works. And so we need to understand that we are each instruments of blessing. And this is about more than praying or speaking a blessing, important as that is. But just as important is that we live our lives every day in a way that radiates blessings in a multitude of ways. We really, when we really see people, when we project good intentions towards them, when we, when we think good thoughts about them, when we do good to them, when we help them grow closer to God and move toward their God-dreamed future, then the Lord has in fact blessed them. When you bless them, God has blessed them. You are an agent of blessing. So let me offer five Agents of Blessing Perspectives. Everybody doing okay? You guys are packed in here, aren't you? I like it. 
So um, five agents of blessing perspectives. Here's the first. Refuse to leave anyone unblessed. Refuse to leave anyone unblessed. One of the most famous blessing stories in history is the story of Isaac, son of Abraham, and how he gave his full blessing to his son Jacob rather than to his son Esau. Most of you are familiar with this story. It is a beautiful story. It is a tragic story. Here's the beautiful part. It's how Jacob, or pardon me, Isaac blessed Jacob. Genesis 27. Here's what, here's what Isaac says to his grown son. Come here, my son, and kiss me. The smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness and abundance of grain and new wine. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers. May he give you and your descendants the blessing given to Abraham. It's beautiful. But it's also tragic because when Esau heard that Jacob had received his father's blessing instead of him, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, me too, my father. Now, this isn't a young child crying in the presence of his father, begging him for his blessing. Esau was a grown man. He was a married man. He was a certifiable tough guy. He was an outdoorsman. He was somebody you didn't want to mess with. Jacob and brother was scared out of his mind in the presence of his brother Esau. But Esau, we're told in Hebrews, sought the blessing with tears. Esau's desperation in this moment is a natural and instinctive response from a person who has not received the blessing that they need and want. And each of us have people in our sphere of influence who have a hole in their heart because they have not received the blessing that they need and want and which God wants to give them. But God is waiting for you to take the action necessary to bring them his blessing. So we have to pay attention. We have to see the people around us, not just look at them. We have to see them. We must take action to bless them. We must not leave anyone unblessed. And you might be surprised who some of those people are. There are obvious ones like our children and spouses and close friends, but there are also em employers and employees and neighbors and fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. God has entrusted us with the immense responsibility to bless those who need to be blessed. Here's the second perspective. Refuse to leave yourself unblessed. Or the way I've written it here is put yourself in a position to receive blessing. That's actually not the way I wrote it. The way I wrote it is position yourself to receive blessing. You, as I read that story about Esau a few moments ago, you may have been surprised at how that touched your heart because you feel that you are in the realm of the unblessed in some way. And what I've discovered, doesn't matter if it's a 35-year-old professional athlete or the CEO of a company or a, 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 a teenager old enough to really grasp this concept. When we have not received the blessing that we need and want. There is a hole in our heart. And I, I, I want to encourage you that as we talk about this subject and as I challenge us to bring blessing to others, that you make sure that you ask for the blessing that you need and want. Because asking for a blessing positions you to receive blessing. So scripture tells us that God knows what we need before we ask, before we ask him. But at the same time, it tells us that we're supposed to ask him. Why? Because asking, asking exercises our will and confesses our faith, and God wants us to ask him for the things even that he knows we already need. So if you want a blessing from God, you need to ask God for it. Well, this is much more true when it comes to the people around you who may be in a unique position to bring blessing to you. They do not know what you need before you ask. In fact, you may think that that person's reading your mind. Your husband surely knows your every thought. But let me promise you, as a husband of 40 years, he does not know very many of your thoughts. 
and uh, you may think my dad surely knows that I need, or you, I'm just going to tell you, don't presume anybody knows the things they need to know about you unless you say them. And, and, and there are some times when we need to ask for the blessing that we need. And we do this with patience and understanding. We don't do this in a condemnatory, why haven't you done this for me kind of way. We, we do it with patience and understanding. I can imagine you saying, for instance, dad or mom or brother or sister or friend or someone with spiritual authority in my life. You may not know the outsized role you play in my life. What you feel and think about me is more important to me than you may be aware. I would like you, I need you to speak a blessing over me, and I need to have an ongoing sense of your blessing as I move forward in my life. And, and then if, if they need help uh, knowing how to give a blessing, uh, uh, help them know how to do that. And one of the things that I'm, I'm grateful for in, in the, this book that I've written, The Lord Bless You, is there is a section in the book that helps people understand how to give someone else a blessing. And it, it might be that you might say, or if you can find another resource perhaps that does it better than my book, please use that. But it might be that you say, I, I know this may not be a subject you're familiar with, but here, you know, check out, I think in, in, in my book it's chapter 16, and, and maybe we have a conversation here in a couple of weeks about this. Um, one of the things that's been exciting uh, last night and today are how many people are, are not just buying a book for themselves, but they're buying books both to gift to friends and also to fulfill this kind of purpose where they're saying, on one hand, I want to bring blessing into your life. On the other hand, you may be someone that I need to understand this because I need you to know how much I need your blessing in my life. Now, there also may be some key person in your life who is incapable of offering you their blessing. Maybe they're just spiritually or emotionally incapable. There are folks like that, or, or perhaps uh, they're no longer with us. The first thing I would say to that is, I'm sorry. The second thing I would say is find a surrogate blesser. Find someone to stand in their stead, someone that you respect and love and ask them to bless you. There's a young pastor in New Jersey, uh, a dynamic young man leading a dynamic church in Asbury Park, New Jersey, who lost his father when he, uh, this pastor, was in his, I believe, late 20s. And he's uh, emotionally intelligent enough and biblically informed enough to know he needs someone, not to replace his father because no one can do that, but, but his father's not there to stand in his father's stead and to, to play this role of, of bringing the blessing, in this case, of someone in, spirit, in spiritual authority into his life. And, and he, he knew about me and, and had met me and for whatever reason found himself attracted to me. That may sound strange and uh, don't, don't misunderstand it, please. Uh, but uh, he, 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 he felt like that maybe I could play this role in his life. And he sought me out. In fact, he, for a while, he kind of stalked me. Uh, it was like, I, 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 and, 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 and we ended up developing a relationship that is, means more to me probably than it does to him at this stage. And I get to play this role of, of, of you know, when, when he has a child, I dedicate the baby and so on and so forth. And, and you may have someone around you who can play that kind of role in your life, but it's not going to happen unless you are intentional about asking for it. Okay, And then, one other thing about this. I think while we all need to surround ourselves with people who constantly convey their blessing to us by loving us, believing in us, speaking words of faith into us, and helping us move towards our God-inspired dreams. That may be a small group here at North Rock. It may be serving on a ministry team, a, a, a rock star team, I think you call it here, at, 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 at North Rock. Or it may be a Bible study that you're participating in or, or, or something. Surround yourself. Guys, this is so important. The scripture, Proverbs 18, 21, says that the power of life and death is in the power of the tongue. Surround yourself with with people whose words bring you life. Make, you have to, this doesn't happen accidentally in life. You have to be intentional about it. And that's one reason churches provide things, various types of ministries for people to engage in, because you surround yourself with people who, uh, who are conveying blessing to you. Make it happen 
for you in your life. Here's the third perspective. View yourself then as a blessing radiator. You may not see yourself now as a person who's in a position to bless others, but if you are blessed by God, you are in a position to bless others. Daniel Goleman, the author of the groundbreaking uh, works on emotional intelligence and social intelligence, wrote that emotions are contagious and that we transmit and catch moods from each other. We catch feelings from each other as though they were some kind of social virus. And I like that. But more importantly, I think that we catch blessings from each other. That, that each of us should see ourselves as a blessing contagion infecting everything around us. A positive pandemic <laughs> of infectious blessing that just gets off of us and onto people. And it's like we can't even help it wherever we are. Just blessing is happening, and we see this demonstrated in Scripture in the family of Abraham, how that blessing flowed from Abraham to his family and from his family to those who were around him, Abraham's grandson. Jacob, for instance, was so blessed that blessing overflowed into the house of his father-in-law and employer Laban, who wasn't a very nice guy. Jacob had had it with him. He wanted to leave employment and and get away from the in-laws and... uh, uh, he 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 is trying to get out of his out of out of out of the deal, but but Laban says, "If I have found favor in your eyes, please stay. The Lord has blessed me because of you." And then he added, "Name your wages, and I will pay them." I like this. Why is Laban blessed? He's blessed just because Jacob is a part of his business. He's blessed just because Jacob is a part. It's like when you when blessing is flowing in you, it 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 flows onto others. And by the way. You need to realize your value as an employee next time you're going and asking for a raise and hope to be in a position, and I mean this with all of my heart, where you're bringing such blessing to the business, they'll, it's like Laban, name your wages, Jacob, as long as you don't leave, because I am blessed because of you. You see this happen as well through Jacob's son, Joseph. Jacob's son Joseph ends up being enslaved in the house of Potiphar. Potiphar is not a very nice guy. Potiphar, Genesis 39 says, put him, Jacob, in charge of his household and of all that he owned. The Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had. I'm thinking eventually about how Egypt all of Egypt was blessed by Joseph's presence and how that when Joseph brought his father Jacob to meet Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world, we're told that Jacob blessed Pharaoh. I love it. Jacob blessed Pharaoh. You might say, I'm not in a position to bless someone else and you're working with someone who you are bringing blessing to in ways that you can't even imagine And so we see this in how Jacob blessed Pharaoh. So see yourself as a living, breathing, blessing transmitter. Be intentional about this. Understand the power you have because you've been blessed by God. Everyone in your life, even all of you all the way back on the back row in the dark over there, everyone in your life will be blessed because of you. Here's the fourth perspective. Picture those you are uniquely responsible to bless and insist on giving them your blessing. So, everybody in your world should be blessed because you're present, okay? But then there are some people, and you know, particularly, let's say if you're a parent, your children need to receive a blessing from you that they really can't receive in that way from anyone else. So when you think about things like that, and others of us in other positions, I have people in my world as a pastor who I'm in a unique position to bless them in some way, and we need to see that and accept responsibility for that. And and I think a, a lot of the blessing that I'm talking about that we convey comes in informal ways. It's the way we live. It's the way we think. It's the way we we express generosity and so on and so forth. But 
I do think that there are times, and Scripture shows this, where there should be some kind of a formal blessing offered. I don't necessarily even think that's one time. For instance, as it concerns our children, I think that this happens at, at certain passages in life where we should take advantage of some life passage uh, or celebration, such as a wedding or a signature birthday, or maybe we even we create a unique occasion to uh, follow the biblical pattern of laying our hands on a person or touching them in some other appropriate way and speaking a blessing over their life that helps create the reality that God envisions for them. When Jacob blessed his grandsons, for instance, he put them on his knees, he kissed them, he embraced them, he laid his hands on their heads. When people brought people to Jesus, uh, we're told that he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them and blessed them. Can I say something to you dads? I haven't said this in the first two services and I need to be careful to not go off because I don't. the other people are coming soon. So... Know the power, Dad, of laying your hands on your children. You may feel awkward in that kind of space. You may feel like that's just for the preacher. It's a powerful thing. There are some times, as my, as my sons have become men, I've almost felt awkward sometimes, uh, uh, you know, just let, but, but nonetheless, you got to break through that barrier because you need to know that you are a primary agent of God's blessing in your children's life. So man up. And accept your responsibility to be an agent of blessing. Pardon me if that was too in your face. I, I'm working on being more intentional about this. For instance, recently my youngest son Christian celebrated his 30th birthday. Christian is a, is a pastor who serves on our staff, albeit now he and his wife Amanda, who also serves on our staff, live in London where he's finishing his PhD and uh, they're serving virtually leading our online campus. Uh, but uh, he celebrating his 30th birthday, his wife Amanda, you see a picture of me blessing them as they were moving to London in front of the congregation, uh, one of the occasions where I seized this opportunity. But his wife Amanda asked each member of the family and close friends to write something appropriate for Christian on his 30th birthday. I saw that as an opportunity to bring a blessing. And so I thought through what it means to bring a blessing, how that to bring a blessing has to do with speaking words that convey unconditional love, express how much that person is valued, how that you're specific about praiseworthy things that he or she has done and detail a positive quality that you've observed, how that we speak in faith about good things we see for their future and articulate ways that we're going to get involved to help that future come to pass. So I thought through that and I wrote these simple words for my son. I wrote sometime around Jesus' 30th birthday. His father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I can think of no more appropriate words to speak to you as you turn 30. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I love you unconditionally but I am also pleased at the way you have conducted your life to this moment. I am especially pleased at your commitment to and pursuit of God, Amanda, and your calling. I am excited to see your future unfold and look forward to seeing great success as you finish your formal education, fully engage your calling, and build your family. I pray to be here cheering you on for many years to come. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Happy birthday. I intend to be intentional about doing those sorts of things so my children, and not just my children, but other people who I have unique influence over, will never feel unblessed in their lives. I am the person God wants to use to bring them blessing. Here's the fifth perspective. Bend low to bless the apparently unblessable. Bend low to bless the apparently unblessable. Some time ago, I read a beautiful story written by a surgeon who shared his heart-rending experience of removing a tumor from a young woman's cheek and how, though he tried, as he wrote, with religious fervor to limit the damage to her face, a twig of the nerve to the muscles of her mouth was severed. After the surgery, he stood at her bedside and was crestfallen to, as he wrote, see her face post-operative, her mouth twisted in palsy, clownish. And he said that her husband 
stood on the opposite side of the bed and gazed at his wife and her distorted mouth with unquestioned love. The young wife asked the doctor, will my mouth always be like this? And he said, yes, it will be. The nerve was cut. She lay there in devastated silence, but her husband smiled and said, I like it. It's kind of cute. And then the surgeon wrote elegantly, at once I know who he is. I understand and lower my gaze. One is not bold in an encounter with a God. Then the young man bowed low to kiss his wife's crooked mouth. And the doctor was close enough to see, he wrote, how he twist his own lips to accommodate hers, to show her that their kiss still works. When I read this story, I can't help but think of the incarnation, how that through Jesus, the God of the universe bowed low to assume the nature and form of a human being. He did this so he could meet us in our wounded condition and demonstrate his love for us. When God created human beings in his own image, he wanted to look at men and women and see his own reflection. He wanted to smile and see us mirror his smile back. Because of sin, however, the God image was distorted and the human smile became crooked at best. But God, who was determined to bless the people he had made, rearranged himself into a form that could kiss our twisted smile. In the incarnation, God was saying that he had found a way to meet us in our scarred condition. He devised a way to match his holiness to our humanity. He bowed low to kiss us, to show us his love. And then I think, so that's how God treated us. What does that mean for how we should treat people? Sometimes we have people in our lives who are not just unblessed, but who seem unblessable. They have crooked smiles, not because of any decision anyone else made, but because of decisions that they've made. Can we bow low to kiss that person? Can you kiss their crooked mouth? I'm talking about perhaps you have a teenager who's in a season right now that feels plagued. Or an adult child whose decisions have broken your heart. Or perhaps on another level, you don't see very much to affirm in your spouse right now. Or maybe you have a friend that you feel estranged from because of some choices they have made or in some other significant relationship with someone who just seems unblessable. But remember, Jesus brought us God's blessing even in our utter depravity. Paul told the Romans, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How might, how, how might that impact the way that you think about loving others who need your blessing, particularly those who may at this point in your life seem unlovable? I mean, guys, Jesus set the bar pretty high. He said, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. So maybe it's easy to bless the four-year-old who wants you to read to them every night, but not as easy to bless a 25-year-old who's made some poor life choices. But our job is to demonstrate God's love and to bend low and kiss their crooked mouth. See, part of what happened through the incarnation as well is Jesus, by showing up, by bringing God's blessing, reconciled us to God. To reconcile means to turn an enemy into a friend. And scripture says that 
before we believed in Jesus, we were enemies to God. But Jesus, <laughs> he turns us from enemies of God to friends of God. And see, this is what happens. This is what happens when we step out of our comfort zone to bless the unblessable. Sometimes we turn enemies into friends and they become a source of great blessing in our lives. So I'll just finish by praying that priestly prayer over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be gracious to you and make his face shine upon you and give you peace. The Lord bless you. Just close your eyes. Let's, let's pray together. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for this incredible word today. And I thank you for just reminding us of the significant role that you have called us to in our world, to be agents of blessing, to be carriers of happiness, <laughs> to be contagions of blessing. God, I just pray that you would help us to seize every day, to seize every opportunity, to not miss those moments. To not, as Pastor Terry said, just look at the people around us, but to see the people around us. To see that they need us. And God, as you have blessed us, as you have poured hope and joy and freedom and life into, into our hearts, God, let it overflow. Let that blessing overflow, God, and touch just everyone around us in the office at school Lord, on the team lord jesus in our neighborhood wherever it is let us be blessing carriers everywhere we go in jesus name as we continue to pray if you're in the room today in any of our locations or watching online and you're not in a relationship with jesus right now then today is your day this is your moment. There is no reason to go one moment longer without placing Jesus in the center of your life or in the, in the middle of everything that, that you are doing. And I know some of you showed up today and you feel somewhat like the story. You feel like your mouth is so crooked, like you have made so many mistakes. You have fallen to such a place that how in the world could Jesus reach to me? Why would he even want to? I want you to know that he loves you just like you are. He loves you so much. He bent low to get to you. He accepts you just like you are. He just loves you too much to leave you that way. He wants to take your sadness and turn it to joy. He wants to take what you have been bound by and completely set you free. He wants to take your loneliness and, and bring you peace, bring you favor. He wants to bless you. But you have to open the door and let him in. The scripture says in Revelation chapter 4 that he's knocking. It's just up to us to open the door and let him in. So if you're in the room today and you know that you need Jesus in your life, you you need him to save you. Maybe you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. This is your moment. Or maybe you need to rededicate, re-surrender your life. You just need a fresh start today. This is your moment. So I'm going to pray a prayer of surrender. But I want to see everyone who wants to be included in this prayer. So with heads bowed, eyes closed at every location. If you'd say, Jonathan, I, I want to be included in this prayer. Will you just throw a hand in the air right now? Come on, throw it. Throw that hand in the air. Hold it up high, please. Every location. I need a fresh start. Come on, that's beautiful. All over the building. That's right, Bolverde. Hold them up, Midtown. That's good. Leave them up. Leave them up. Leave them up. I want to see every one of them. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yes, yes, yes. Right down here. Yes, I love it. Mm, mm, love it. Hands all over the building. Okay, you can put your hands down now. 
I'm going to pray a simple prayer of surrender. I invite everybody to pray this along with me. You can use your words or you can use mine. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you today. On this amazing weekend, this first weekend in August of 2023, this is a milestone moment for me. I'm surrendering my life completely to you, Jesus. I repent today, God. I ask you to forgive me for my sins, Lord. Make my life clean like only you can. I am making you the Lord of my life. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you gave your life for me and that you rose from the grave. And today, I'm starting over and I'm following you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Come on, a big hand for all of those who just took that step of faith, y'all.